Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop. And tonight, we've got a great guest, as we always do, but we needed some bubbliness and effervescence, and we want to talk about the trends in voiceover today. So we have our good friend, Laura Schreiber, who's a, someone who keeps up with the trends. Hey, Laura, how you doing? Hi, I'm so glad to be here. We're so glad to have you. George, are you ready to roll with this? Let's do it. I'm 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 all oiled up. I got my tea. Let's You're make all this oiled happen. up. Jeez. All right. It's time for voiceover body shop right now. It's time for voiceover body shop. Brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the makers of Source Connect. VoiceOver Heroes, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voice actor website doesn't have to be a pain in the butt. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. Well, I'm glad we're all lubed up to get this show on the road here tonight. Oil can. Anyway, why am I wearing a fez? You've seen me wear the fez before, but uh, we've been gone for a while. I, I mean, what's yeah. the last show we did with, with uh, well, we did we did Tech Talk, but we had Scott Parkin on like a month ago. It was a month ago, right. You know, and I was on an 18-day, seven-flight odyssey from <laughs> L.A. to Florida to Madrid to America, no, to Casablanca, and a bus tour to Fez, Rabat, Marrakesh, and all these places, and then from Marrakesh to Madrid to the Canary Islands to visit our good friend Ramesh, our our one fan in the Canary Islands, and uh, <laughs> and then to Barcelona, had some tapas, and flew 13 hours back to L.A. from Barcelona. 18 days. Not one Incredible. flight was late, and our baggage was everywhere. It was like, why is everybody having trouble? Other people on our trip, they all got... They, Flights out of, out of Lisbon all got canceled. So anyway. Did you put a flare gun in your bag? I hear that if, if you have a flare gun in your uh, luggage, they keep extra good care of it. Really? <laughs> I, I did not know that. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to show you a couple of quick pictures. Not a huge amount of stuff. but Show us the good ones. Right. All right. Which, so, are, which there are many. Oh, well, all right. We'll start with this one. This is Toledo in Spain. So I wrote a paper on it in college, so I'm like, okay, we're going to be in Madrid for a couple of days, got to go see Toledo. Got on the train, went to Toledo. This is the Alcazar up there, the King, old king's palace, which has been rebuilt about five times. So much stuff was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War. And then uh, we went to Casablanca, and it's nothing like the movie. Well, sort of. It's As you can see, it's a big, humongous city, but the biggest thing there is the King... Uh, Mohammed the Sixth Mosque, it just dominates uh, the whole. That is skyline. massive. That tower is humongous. It, that is a big tower, and it's a big mosque. I mean, yeah. that that's like bigger than Madison Square Garden. It's it's huge. <laughs> wow. And then from there, uh, we were on our way to Fez, and we stopped at this place, a place called Vesubilis, a Roman city from two thousand years ago. You know, it's been disturbed by a couple of earthquakes and stuff, but look at the floors in this place. It was amazing. And you could, like, literally stand in front of the shop stalls that were, you know, they were, they're, they're right there. You could tell they were shop stalls. And you, it was I'm a bizarre. Thinking, yeah, yeah, and you, you could literally hear some, you know, one of the shopkeepers going, hey, Octavius, come here, I got to show you something. You know, it's like. And cool. and and then we went to uh, to Marrakesh, and, of course, in the Shook, you tend to buy stuff. Uh, so I bought a Moroccan shirt. Marcy Did they bought... shook you down? No, <laughs> no, we shook them down. It's like <laughs> Hagel central. Yeah, you know? of course. Yeah. And, and of course, so I bought a Moroccan shirt and Mar Marcy bought a Moroccan dress, which she put on and immediately saw that it was basically transparent. So she had to put some yoga pants under that. And then I found out 
that according to the waiter in this restaurant where we had our, this goodbye dinner, it was that this is not a Moroccan fez. It is a Tunisian fez. Uh-oh. I'm like, I bought this fez in fez. Why would a fez from fez in Morocco be a Tunisian fez? And they don't even wear fezes in Tunisia. They wear berets. So, you know, Go the, figure. Our, our guide said adds baloney. And then, oh, great. and then we went to the Canary Islands to visit Ramesh. Who knew there was a 12,000 foot volcano out in the Atlantic Ocean? But there it is. The whole island is a big, it's like the Maui of the, the, the Atlantic. Very similar idea. And look at these rocks. It was like, if you were there at night, you would thought you were on the moon. Just an amazing thing. But Ramesh lives in paradise. He says, come visit me in paradise if you're in the neighborhood. Well, I'm in Morocco. Okay, we're going to be in the neighborhood. We fly to Tenerife. Beautiful. If you want to go somewhere that's unexpectedly fabulous, go to the, go to the Canary Islands. It's really cool. So, anyway. I can I'm glad it. it all went smoothly and it looks, ama- it looks amazing. Yeah. Add I that mean, to the bucket list. Right. There was a lot more to it than that. But now I can take off my fez and let <laughs> Mishka wear it. And there we go. It did make a... Sucking sound as you pulled it off your head as I expected to. <laughs> exactly. So, and what did you do while we were gone? Uh, you know, I mostly I was uh, trying to convince my girlfriend to come back from Iran, which sounds weird. But <laughs> I, I take it you finally <laughs> succeeded at that. I did. I picked her up on Sunday. She's home safe and sound, back from Iran and, and sleeping right now, which is normal after a 12-hour change of time zone. Yeah. Um, it's pretty, but, uh, and just... Stayed active, cycling, doing some adventure riding, had a really fun Halloween uh, weekend, so much going on, sang karaoke on the back of a trailer, being pulled by a tandem electric bike, Uh, you know, (laughs) all kinds of wackadoodle stuff, and had a good old friend from Portland who's relocating to Southern California, stay with me a few days, and it was a, a lot of, it was a great time, so. Great. Back to regular life and, uh, domestic life, and. Right. Cleaning up after myself again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, bachelorhood. Yeah, it's, I remember that like 30 years ago. Anyway, uh, we have a great guest tonight, and we're going to introduce her now. This is a young lady who I've known for a while. She is a very successful voice artist, and she knows about the trends in the voice uh, over business. So why don't we welcome to the show, Laura Schreiber. How you doing, babe? I'm so excited to be here with you guys tonight. What a delight. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. We've been looking forward to having you on for some time, and the time was right. And of course, we got to hang out this weekend at Mavo in, uh, at, in, in Washington, and that was... Did you have a good time? Meet lots of cool people? I had the best time between connecting with old friends like you and meeting new ones. I left feeling so inspired, and then I was really tired this morning. <laughs> That's like me too. You know that feeling of like being so charged and I was like running on adrenaline driving home. I had a really long drive back. Yeah. And then this morning I kind of crashed and was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. what am I do? From inspired to tired. You have yeah. been yeah. inspired. Yes. Yeah. You know, yes. And, you know, and after you've been on a really long trip and you wake up and you start petting the dog and it's like, what is the dog doing with us in Morocco? <laughs> <laughs> like, like what? Where where am I? Oh, right. I'm home. <laughs> well, actually, that hotel is dog friendly, it turns out. And I had this thought of like, do I bring one or both of the dogs next year? And then I was like, no, because I don't want to have to go back to the room to walk my dogs. But, right. but there were other dogs there. They were I, running through the lobby. And was... and they were cute. But better than the dogs were the people. Oh, my God. What a nice <laughs> group. And I was amazed. People from the UK, people from Tokyo, besides all the, like, I thought it was impressive that West Coasters were coming. And then yeah. when there was a lady from Tokyo in my sessions, oh my God, my oh, mind she was, was from blown. Tokyo. I thought she, she was, was a local. <laughs> no. Well, there, there were two Japanese women who were authentically Japanese, like, like from Japan, but right. one flew in from Tokyo for me though. Wow. My mind was blown. And she was in both my breakout session and my general session. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I thought that was so cool because, I, I mean, I've never considered going to Tokyo for a voiceover conference. I don't even know what voiceover conferences they have. They must. It's cool. I, I, we know there's a lot of, you know, English expats, expats there yeah. teaching English, you know, yes. that, are, that have been doing this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. You know. Anyway, let's get into the meat of the matter. If you have a question for Laura, because we're going to talk about the trends in the voiceover business, and I think that's going to create lots of questions on all of your parts. 
Um, so if you have a question and you're in Facebook or you're on YouTube Live, you can go into the chat rooms in either of those and write your question in. And I know Jeff Holman is back with us. Uh, not sure what movie he's working on today, but apparently not at the moment. So he's taking down the questions in the, uh, the social chat. So if you have a question, throw it in there and we will get to those in just a little bit, but let's get underway with really what we wanted to talk about. Um, now I know you're a very successful voice artist, but what's unique about your background that makes you stand out when booking? Because I think most people wonder, how can I stand out and not like a sore thumb? So it's interesting. I actually talked about standing out when booking less in my trend session and more in my branding session. Um, That was something we talked about so much. And we talked about this concept um, from Malcolm Gladwell's book of being an outlier, which is actually not about voiceover at all. If you've read that book, he talks about everybody from um, professional hockey players in both the U.S. and Canada studies and research that have been done on them to um, lawyers in New York City. And he talks about Uh, what makes people successful in their field? What makes them stand out? He uses this concept of an outlier and he Mm -hmm. talks about having a superior and unique skill set. And I said, you kind of have to establish yourself as an outlier because there are a lot of people who do what we do. And there are a lot of people who do what we do well. So it's not about your voice and voiceover. What makes you do well in voiceover is not your voice. It's your story. It's what you did before today that you bring into the booth with you. So for me personally, I came into voiceover um, from a back from being a history teacher. I taught middle and upper school history at an all girls school in Manhattan, um, and I have a unique educational background. I went to Columbia for college and for graduate school. I have a, a, an advanced degree in history. I studied modern European history and was specifically interested in social history of France in the 1890s and women's position and status as it changed when the city was modernized. Um, And I'm proficient in other languages. So I have a very different academic background compared to other people in our field. But when you're trying to build your voiceover career, it's how you can connect with clients and show them why you stand out. And that's how you can really make yourself shine because a lot of people might submit a similar read. So what does the client see in you that's different? Um, And for me, it's not just my academic background. That's not what I'm trying to pitch. For me, it's the service that I provide, the relatability, the fact that I have this great booth that George helped me set up, um, that I can provide excellent audio with a quick turnaround within budget. These are all the things that I try to connect with. Mm. Once again, we're talking with Laura Schreiber. If you got a question for her, throw it in the chat room. We would be thrilled to hear from you. Uh, so why does it matter if you understand the current trends? I mean, I'm okay. an old fogey and I, you know, and I'm like, I, I don't, fo- this Instagram stuff and I, you know, I don't, I, I don't follow it all. I mean, I should. Tickety talk clock. What is that thing called well, again? T- t- trick truck. I, I oh, don't know. Tick tock's so, hard for everyone. Yeah, so why does it under, why does it matter if you, t- to understand all these trends? So trends are super important. So I started my session on commercial trends with a visual. Mm-hmm. So this is the visual. Can everyone see this? Um, this photo? There you, you go. My screen? Okay. So this is a photo from 1990 from my bat mitzvah. So now everyone knows how old I am. But um, <laughs> these outfits were the epitome of fashion in 1990. My dress, my hot pink dress, was custom ordered from a trunk show. It had a high neck. It had puff sleeves. It had rhinestones everywhere. What you can't see is that there were rosettes on my hip. The point of this image that I want you to have in your mind is that in 1990, this was it. This is what like the bat mitzvah dresses were all about. And when you don't know what's on trend when you're submitting an audition, it's like showing up in this dress today. It's like as if I had shown up <laughs> in this outfit to present at Mavo. That's what it seems like to the ears of the people casting you when you don't understand the trend, whether it's a video production agency or a casting director or your talent agent. If you can't keep up with the trends, what that does to your eyes, that's what it's doing to their ears. So you really have to have... A, a system or a strategy to understand what today's trends are. Absolutely. Uh, How can understanding the current trends help you book more work though? So if you have a strategy to 
follow the trends and to do brand research, then when an audition comes your way and you know how to look at what's going on, A, in the industry as a whole, like with commercials, and B, with that brand specifically, is this a, a shift in their campaign? Are they doing a campaign? Are they doing a one-off? Is this going on social media? Is it going on TV? Is it going on the radio? What market is this spot being placed in? Then when you submit it, it shows an understanding of what they're looking for and, and also where your voice fits in with the brand. And, and something else that we touched on um, in my session that's really important is making sure you understand the specs and what's being asked of you. So, for example, if they ask for a voice with gravitas, I never submit. Listen to this voice. No gravitas. Um, if they ask for an African-American female and you're a white female, you should not be submitting. That, that um, would not be a trend. You know, right so for, and, for you I'd, that'd be very off right. trend yeah. and it but it's it's like highly offensive if you don't meet the specs and you're specifically not in the right category to submit so for example if they're doing an lgbtq plus casting and you're not an lgbtq plus person you should not submit um i had referred someone to an agent a student that i coached and the job was for an African-American female and he was a white male. And this, this agent had sent the casting out to everyone on their roster, assuming that the people who didn't meet the specs would know not to submit. And this talent not only submitted, but this is a straight male and he attempted to make his voice sound like a woman's voice. That is not what is being asked of you. And you have to understand that. So now I just don't assume anything and I tell everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's pretty much what you do not assume that people have common sense. <laughs> now, well, yeah, after after a bunch of years in this business, that's actually more the fact than anything mm -hmm. else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. I wasn't referring to anyone specific out there who does any casting, though. Uh, once again, if you've got a question for Laura Schreiber about trends and branding and stuff like that, throw it in the chat room. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the matter here. What are some of the trends that we should be mindful of when submitting auditions? What's going on today? So there's a lot. And and um, when I covered them, I went about it in two ways. A, I made, um, well, the scripts that we looked at this weekend were really fun. And I made a, a packet of like 25 different scripts that were running. And we I made a montage of commercials that are presently airing on TV. And when I talk about trends, trends tend to shift. Now, it depends on if a brand is in the middle of a campaign and a campaign could run for three months, it could run for six months. So you kind of have to do brand research and see how often that brand changes. So for example, Scott Perkins' Tide Spot has been running for quite a while. Tide hasn't changed their spot. But some brands like Audi might change their spot every six months, every three months. So you don't know and you have to see kind of like where that shift is coming. But um, in terms of what trends we're seeing right now, in the specs, conversational, authentic, a real person, someone who doesn't sound polished or salesy. This is very common right now. Right. Um, there's a lot of they don't want you to sound they want you to sound real. They don't want you to sound they want you to sound like the girl next door, the guy next door. They want you to sound relatable. Um, there is actually um, for both men and women, still a call for the announcer read, but it's very specific, not just in automotive, in retail, not just in Black Friday spots, um, in brands like Target, Kohl's, Raymore and Flanagan's, you still see those announcer reads, Macy's, um, there, that, that does still happen, but it's not the, um, the trend in terms of like every read, they will specifically say we want the the announcer read. Or if you if it says retail, that's what they're looking for. That's the buzzword. Um, the other thing that is a big trend is celebrity touchstones, and they might say they want a Reese Witherspoon, a Sigourney Weaver, a uh, Samuel L. Jackson. And the funny thing that I've been noticing in some agent auditions is that they'll ask for some touchstones of people who have passed. Uh, so I did go over a big list this weekend of celebrity touchstones that have been asked for in the past three months and it was quite a long list um and you can make yourself more marketable by putting your sound alikes both on your website and your pay to plays and tagging them i actually am not skilled at doing celebrity sound alikes but i have some friends who really work on it and put an effort into it and can do a great job that is not one of my strengths but it is something that's highly sought after right 
and and of course the pandemic had trends within the pandemic you know yes. to, it was it was very different i mean it was like you know from hyper to all of a sudden everybody's stuck in their house and it's like we're all together well, and at the beginning of the pandemic, you had that shift where a lot of the commercials that had video footage were all animation, right? Because nobody could get video footage. So right. the reference that was happening at the um, beginning of the pandemic, every spot, they wanted to be like the chase spot. They wanted it to be like, your bank could be here or your bank could be here or your bank could be here. And they had would have like the bubble of the bank and it was this animated spot. And like I did old age home spots like that. I did hotel spots like that. I mean, it was like, and they all had this one chase spot for like an 18 month period as the reference. And you were like, oh my God, if one more person asks <laughs> yeah, me for the chase spot. Those, yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of that. And it's, and then it slowly shifted back to what you're talking about now. Yes. And then the other thing is like really being able to dissect the conversational read, like, because they say they want the conversational read. So you're talking about varied pace and intonation, um, different inflection, uh, keeping it in like not being sing-songy, keeping it natural. But at the same time, um, your diction being good, but not being too overpronounced. So having contractions, even if the script isn't written with contractions, maybe being a little more conversational and saying like, I'm talking to you and not like I'm not being like overly forced with it. So really understanding what it means to be conversational when you've had training. Right. Uh, once again, if you're just joining us, well, you've missed it all already. But there's still more to come uh, with Laura Schreiber, uh, and she is uh, talking to us about trends. What are trends in the voiceover business? So, uh, again, if you have a question, throw them in the chat room because I know everybody's like, oh, well, what about this? What about that? So now would be a good time to throw those in there. Okay, so once I know all these trends, once... I'm aware of what it is that we're supposed to be doing in our auditions and, and stuff like that. Are you all set? Can you like stop following them? No, because they change. So you kind of, every time that uh, you audition, it's your responsibility to do market research. When these auditions come your way, whether it's direct from a client or from an agent, or if you're submitting on a pay to play, it's your job to do constant ongoing market research. So, um, for example, I'm on a veil for a spot for a pretty big brand. And before I submitted, I did a lot of market research to see what their other spots were like, what their preferred tone is like, what do they look for when they cast? And I think this is why um, it's your responsibility to do ongoing market research, because the more research you do, the more likely you are to book a spot. So I'm not with one of the top five agencies, even though, of course, like everyone, I would love to be. But I'm not with an Atlas or a CESD or a DPN. But I do have wonderful regional representation that's gotten me access to some great work. And I think the reason I've had success booking national spots and booking with brands like Disney, Smirnoff, Gap, Dove, um, brands that we all know and love is because I'm consistent with my strategy and I have follow through and it does work. There's not like, I think it's a combination of hard work and consistency. And if you follow through and you are strategic, it's possible to book a commercial with any of these brands. You just have to stay on top of it. Yeah. What's a good way to stay on top of it? Watch the commercials? And, yeah, and I I, but I, I don't just look for commercials on iSpot. I go on their YouTube. I go on their social media. And I don't just try to go back one year. I look at like where they were and what they booked last and how many they have running to see like, you know, because you don't know whether it's going to be a one-off or a campaign and if they're doing a major trend. So for example, look at Chewy. Chewy's a fascinating brand and I've never actually done work for Chewy, but I love Chewy and I order my dog food on Chewy. So I'm love to work with Chewy. Right. Chewy tends to book multiple spots at a time and they tend to book like these. They don't tend to hire women with my vocal range thus far, but maybe they would pivot and they would do that. They tend to book women with a mid, mid range voice and they tend to be very conversational, although they have been doing some that are like characters where the voiceover is actually the voice of an animal. And they tend to be like um, kind of flat and subtle in their read and they tend to have like sarcasm and humor and humor and right. they they're really well written scripts um the one consistent thing about all of chewy scripts is that they're really well written 
but they tend not to pick people with my vocal range. They tend to always be like a mid-range woman or maybe someone with a little rasp to her voice. It's really interesting. Yeah, usually talking as a dog. Well, they just had one that was talking as a cat, which was fascinating. Right. And But they tend to, to, to have several spots running at a time that are all similar. So you can learn a lot about a brand if you research it. Yeah. So, so speaking of brands, this is sort of jumping a little bit ahead, you know, a little off the thing of, of the trends. But why does having a brand matter for voice actors? We've been hearing this for years, like you got to have your brand. Is that strictly for commercial or does that really go across the board? It goes across the board. It doesn't matter if you want to work in corporate narration or e-learning or IVR or character. When you're a voice actor, you're a small business owner and you want the people who hire you, whether it's a law firm who needs a phone message or it's a creative director whose casting is going to come back to you again and again to have a reason to connect with you. And the reason is your brand and your brand is your story. It's who you are. And it's what we started talking about at the beginning. It's why you were different. It's what you bring to the table that makes you stand out from everyone else. It's what do you have? It's why am I different than George? It's why is my skill set different than George's skill set? And it's why is working with me uniquely different than the next gal because I guarantee you that there's 10 gals who can do a read similar to me and have a similar high range voice to me. So why me? Right. And that's what establishing a strong brand has. It gives uh -huh. them a sense of why you it's the answer to that. Right. Give us an example of like, what do you, how do you brand yourself? So for me, my brand is that in terms of like the way I describe my, there's, there's, so there's multiple layers to the brand, right? There's like the way you describe your voice and the way you describe your personality. So what do I want people to think of when they think of my voice? I want them to think young, happy, millennial, conversational. Those are the, like the main words. When they think of me as a person, I want them to think of like warm, relatable, I'll bend over backwards for them to get them what they need, savvy and helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, can somebody brand you? I mean, I'm, I'm sure so, there's some people who think kinky things about that. Yeah, just right here. But <laughs> so that's so interesting because that was how I started my session. Um, I talked about how when I first started in the industry, Ann Ganguza was my very first coach. That's actually how I found George. And she was amazing. And I did then and still do look up to her so much. And one of the things that drew me to working with Anne was her brand. And if you've ever met Anne or worked with Anne, you know that she has an incredibly strong brand. And from like, even before I started coaching with her, I was so tense. Like, I have to have a brand. I need to get branded. And I thought, like, I need someone to brand me. I just want to pay someone to brand me. I have to be branded. But the problem with that and the flaw in that thinking is that if you think that you can pay someone who's known you for five minutes to brand you, they're going to miss a lot because no one knows you better than you know you. And no right. one can tell your story better than you tell your story. Right. And what so, are you getting hired for? What, what is it that you're consist consistently getting hired for? And if you pay someone to brand you as opposed to you writing your story in your words, in your voice, a lot will be missing. And that's why a brand is kind of a fluid thing that needs to change and evolve. And we talked about, and it's really important because I've read multiple books on the subject, but a brand needs to be expandable. So I don't know if you want to touch on this, but there's lots of ways in which a voice actor can talk about how they're a strong brand is a brand that can expand over the years. But, um, in terms of being branded, you can work with a coach to help you develop your brand. But when you develop your brand collateral and your brand collateral are things like your logo, your colors, your business card, your banner, your email signature, and those all help support and help people get a sense of, sense of the brand that you're promoting, you need it to be somebody who's actually working on creating your brand and the graphics that help promote your brand and not someone who's imposing their idea of what your brand should be and their vision of your brand. And they're two right. very different things. Right. And, and, the, and they, and uh, yeah, and they may have a totally different idea of who you are as opposed to what you think you are. And, and you know, and somebody else who might have a totally different idea from that. And I did, uh, a, I don't know if it was four years in or five years in rebrand and update 
my brand collateral and I stuck with my colors because they were me, but everything else was not a reflection of where my business was at the moment and where I saw myself. And there has to be a marriage between the way you see yourself, the way other people see you and the way you want your clients to perceive you. Those three things have to match. And then all of your correspondence has to be on brand. And when I say that, I don't just mean like your e-signature. I mean like the way you interact with people. So if I want to be seen as warm and helpful and, and upbeat and bubbly, and I get all bent out of shape with a client, I can't send an angry, outraged email, right? Because that's not on brand. I have to kind of take a moment and get it out of my system and then think about like, how I want to communicate this because communications are very much a part of your brand. Right. All righty. Well, it's time to take a break. Uh, We're talking with Laura Schreiber. If you have a question for her, throw it in the chat room. I know Jeff Holman is sitting back there with baited pen uh, to take all that stuff down. And we'll get to those questions in just a minute. And we'll be right back with Laura Schreiber here on voiceover body shop. So don't go away. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The VoiceOver Body Shop. Headphones for voiceover? Why not get the headphones made for voiceover? That's why I use Harlan Hogan's Signature Series Voice Optimized Headphones 2.0 from voiceoveressentials.com. Harlan's cans are incredibly strong and lightweight. At only 8.4 ounces, the combination straight coiled audio cable stretches from 5 to 10 feet. It comes with two gold-plated mini plugs and a studio standard quarter-inch screw-on adapter and includes the new mini jack on the left headphone for easy cord replacement. The studio monitoring headphones are optimized for voice work. Now even better, the Harlan Hogan Signature Series VoiceOver Headphones 2.0. And for a limited time, when you buy the headphones, you'll also get a free autographed copy of Harlan's best-selling book, VO, Tales and Techniques of a VoiceOver Actor, 2nd Edition. It's full of stories from the trenches and insights about making the most of your voiceover career. Go on over to VoiceOver Essentials right now and order yours. Hey, everybody. It's the time on the show where we talk about source elements, the creators of Source Connect and so many other tools. So I've, I'll tell you a quick story about Source Live. They've done a retooling of this tool called Source Source Live. And what's amazing now is studios can send a mix of the audio and the video that's being used, let's say you're doing a commercial, and all the clients can see instant playback within a, a, like a quarter of a second uh, delay of what is being recorded and played back. So they all can see and hear the way it would be if they were just sitting there in the control room at the studio. And this is becoming a much bigger part of the way remote productions are being done. This is used in conjunction with Source Connect. And Source Connect is the tool that the actor is using. That might be you. If you want to be available to to be connected into Source Connect style sessions, which are definitely the types of sessions that tend to pay the best because they have the budget to hire studios and the whole kit and caboodle that comes with producing a commercial at the highest level, you definitely want to get set up. Go over to source-elements.com, get yourself a free trial if that's where you feel like starting, or I recommend subscribing so that you have support right out of the gate. They have really good support. They will walk you through the whole setup process port mapping, whatever it need, whatever you need on your network to make it work reliably. It's fantastic. Thank you, Source Connect. Thank you, Source Elements. And we'll be right back after this. Hey there, I'm David H. Lawrence, the 17th. And with my company, VO Heroes, and my team of coaches and my community of voiceover talent, we guide voiceover actors along their journey. And you may be watching VOBS here uh, and not nearly as far along as many of the other people who are watching. You may not even have started yet. And we actually specialize in helping you do just that. So if you're watching all the stuff going on here on VOBS and going, I have no idea what they're talking about. I don't know, but I really want to do this. I'd really like to help you. Please go to VOHeroes.com slash start. That's VOHeroes.com slash start. And you can take our Getting Started in VoiceOver class, which tells you everything you need to get started as a voice talent. And I'd love to hold your hand along the way and help you with that journey. 
Again, voheroes.com slash start. That's voheroes.com slash start. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Widom. VOBS.TV. And we are back with Laura Schreiber and and her William Wegman's dogs. Uh, <laughs> William Wegman. I, yeah, because you've got a Weimariner. Yeah. The Weimariner no. photographer guy. It's not a Weimariner. It's a silver lab. It's the recessive of a chocolate lab. So no she's way. all kinds of crazy colors, right? Wow. Oh, yeah, my friend had one of them. I yeah. Know. And she's oh. sweet as can be. Super smart. Sure. To be in your house, I, she would have to be. <laughs> so by the way george that was really cool i didn't know that they could send video with the source connect well yeah that's source live you know that's the thing about source elements they have a lot of different products and yeah. source live is something that's not really used by talent it's used by production in the studio but it's just another way that they can make the se sessions run seamlessly for the client so they want to experience it like they're sitting there live and because they've got the latency down so low used to be you would hit play on a on a spot there could be five to 10 second buffering before the yeah. client sees it. So it kind of drags down the playback process. Now it's like about a third of a second latency when they hit play. And so the session flows, you know, how expensive it is. You got yeah. directors and writers and the clients and the studio engineer and the actor and you want it to be smooth. So no, anyway. I have, so not to go off topic, but no, this because, is fine. <laughs> because most of my work, a, a large percentage of it is commercial work. I have Source Connect sessions every single week. And for me, having Source Connect is essential. I actually do have IPDTL too, just because mm -hmm. um, I had a few clients who didn't have Source Connect. I don't mm -hmm. love to use Zoom and I, I'm happy to use Zoom because some people want to see you and it's nice because you can yeah. connect and it's good for relationship building. Mm -hmm. But if if I, I will use IPDTL before I'll use Zoom, if they will. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but with Source Connect, I love connecting on Source Connect. It's fantastic. And you know how many people can be on these calls. Sometimes there's six, seven people on a call. And I didn't know they could do that. That's really cool. It is, yeah. Well, there they go. There's the big endorsement. We didn't even need to, need to do your spot there, George. Yeah, I could have done it. I could have been like, I love Source Connect. <laughs> so continuing on, we, we and again, if you've got a question, you still got time to get your question in to talk to, uh, to Laura Schreiber about uh, branding and trends and stuff like that but one last question for me what happens if someone else's brand is like your brand mm. so that's interesting because um this happens all the time right look at coke and pepsi there's competition people imitate each other but i think the general consensus is that imitation is the biggest form of flattery and it will happen and yes you could get your brand copyrighted and people do that but According to all of the research that I did, and I've been researching this topic for months in preparation for Mavo, the advice is be the best you you could be. When my twins graduated from preschool, they were given a book that had like little fishies all over the cover, and it was called There's Only One You. There's only one you. You're the only person who can tell your story your way. You're the only person who can connect with clients the way they do. So, for example, my brand is very pink. Diana Birdsall is one of my best friends in voiceover, and her brand's very pink. We are in no way copying each other. We just both like pink. There are going to be other people coming down the line who also like pink. They're allowed to have pink. Uh, <laughs> I don't own pink. <laughs> there will be lots of gals who like the color. It just is what it is. But you have to be confident in who you are and what you're offering. And if you are, and if you know yourself and have a strong sense of self, that's all you can do. Um, there was a quote that I read, and I don't remember if it was in Bob Miller's book or if it was in Michael Levine's book that said that Starbucks and BMW are selling more than coffee and cars. So it comes down to when you have a sense of your brand, what are you offering your clients? What service are you providing? And the service as voice actors that we're providing has to go so far beyond voiceover because it's such a competitive industry. And right. yes, it's a huge industry with lots of opportunity, but it's also highly competitive. And now having training with top coaches and having expensive gear is not enough to be the distinguishing factor. It has to be about so much more. So it comes down to your brand. Mm-hmm. 
Once again, Laura Schreiber is our guest, and you still have time to get a question or two in there, so why don't you do that right now? But let's start off with the questions from our massive worldwide audience. George, take it away. And I will say also that having a good internet connection is key, and you clearly have a good connection. Your picture has been flawless. Oh, I have a gig. I have Sharp as a tack. I have amazing. Verizon Fios, and I have a gig. Yeah, no, it's it's flawless. It looks like a local studio feed. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maple J from YouTube says, I'm just getting started. I have my demos. But what should be the next marketing step for me? So more of a generalized marketing question here. Well, Maple, I don't know if you have a website or not, but it's really important that you have a website. You don't want to ever send your clients to a place where there are other voice actors. Like you don't want to be sending them to SoundCloud or to YouTube only. You should have your stuff on YouTube or just to a pay to play. You want to have your website as your virtual storefront. So if you have demos, the next step would be a really solid website. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's part, it's part of your branding too, right? So yeah. that assumes then you've already worked on a branding before you launch the new website, right? It's, it's all, um, there's somebody asked me this question yesterday, in fact, about like if they're doing their website, when do they start their branding and getting the timing right is essential because it kind of like you have to invest in the website and in yourself. And if you've already spent the money on the demos, it's like, where are you putting them? So it, it's kind of like getting the timing just right is tricky. And for those of us who have these massive websites, when you've been in the business for a long time, you're always working on it. This is the answer. Once you start, it's something that you work on and work on and work on. Yeah. When I, I'm, I'm getting very close to having a new website launched that actually is available for everybody. And part of that getting the new website design from the ground up was the branding. And this is my new branding. It's this color scheme and this font. And that all was established in the beginning of the process. Long I before we wireframed and figured out what the site should look like, we had to get the colors and the fonts and the branding of it. Um, right. You know, so that, yeah, that had to happen first really. Cause otherwise it'd be much harder to go back and patch it all in later. You want to get that up front. Yeah. All righty. A uh, question from Jim McNicholas, also watching on YouTube. Other than conversational, which we hear constantly, <laughs> it's conversational read. Uh, what is your best tip to book? Um, my best tip is to always give more than one take. So sometimes um, they will say, not to slate. So don't slate unless you're asked to slate. So if you don't know what slating is, it's when you say like Laura Schreiber for stars. Don't do that unless they specifically say to do that. Um, and then give at least two takes, if not three, if you can. But don't say two takes at the front because you're wasting like that two to three seconds. So your first take should be the closest one to the specs. Your second one should be like, it should be like an A, a B, and a C. It shouldn't be like an A, an A, and an A. Don't give them three takes that are the same. But they want to hear that you have range and versatility. Because if you're not exactly in the pocket, but they see that you might be able to give them something different and take direction well, and they like your voice, it'll give you much more of a chance. So besides conversational, they're typically looking for authentic and relatable. That's very much on trend right now as well. But also, just give them versatility, give them something different and give them something that stands out for your second one or second and third, if you can. All right. Excellent. So yeah. do the Grace. You get the Grace's question. All right. Um, Grace Newton asks, you have an impressive educational background. What is your acting background and what drew you to voice acting? Oh, okay. So um, in terms of my acting background, um, when I decided to go into voiceover, I started working with coaches one genre at a time. So I've worked with coaches from, um, from Ann Ganguza to J. Michael Collins, Nancy Wolfson, um, Eric Romanowski for my imaging. I'm working with Sean Pratt right now for audiobooks. In voiceover, if you don't know this already, your coaching never ends. It's like ongoing professional development forever and ever. And everybody should be going to conferences all the time. And you should be working on your craft daily and always doing something. You should be working on your reading. You should always be doing something. Um, so right now I'm working with Sean and it's amazing. Um, I've worked with so many coaches. So I've worked with... Um, 
Okay, I'm not going to name them all because there's like a gajillion. I've also taken acting and improv at our local theater, which is the Paper Mill Playhouse, which is like a theater that Broadway shows often go to either before they're on Broadway or when they leave Broadway. So I've had like Broadway actors as my acting and improv coaches, which has been fantastic for me. And what was the rest of the question? Um, And just, yeah, what drew you to voice acting in general? Okay. So my journey was really long to voiceover. It started, I don't know how much time we have, so I'll give you the abridged version. Um, At least 10, 15 minutes. Okay. So in the, I went to school in New York City, and if you haven't spent a lot of time in Manhattan, then you might not know that the waiters and waitresses at the restaurants are typically actors and actresses. And my sister also went to college with me, as did my husband and his brother. Anyway, so when my sister and I are asked questions, we often respond in unison, and my voice was even higher when I was young than it is now. So you can imagine what I sounded like as a teenager, right? So people would ask us questions, and we would respond, and the waiters and waitresses would be like, you should go into voiceover. So in like the mid-90s, I went to this bookstore in Times Square that was like just for theater. And I started looking into doing voiceover. And at the time, to go into voiceover, you had to have a demo that was like on cassette and you had to show up in person to casting calls because there was like hardly any internet when I was in college. So nothing was online yet. And it seemed like being a student at Columbia and being a voice actor were mutually exclusive because I worked really long hours in school. But my husband, who I started dating in 1996, would always joke like, well, when you're in voiceover. And it was like literally the standing joke. Um, And then years later, I was at a bat mitzvah in New Jersey, and I was sitting next to a woman named Marie Hoffman, who um, she does a lot of things, but mostly e-learning and audiobooks. And she was telling me about her voiceover career. And I sort of had this, and I knew her from the carpool line at school from drop-off. And I had stopped working for a time and was at home with my children, my twins that are now in college. And um, I had this moment of like, if she can do it, I could do it. Like, what am I waiting for? So um, I asked her if I could call her and ask her questions. And she was kind enough to say yes. And we literally had a four-hour phone conversation, which led to like a six-month period of research and writing a business plan. And I come from an academic background. So for me, nothing happens without like excessive research and like making charts and like if this voice actor is doing this now, what are they booking and where will they be? And that was sort of my path to see like, is this really what I want to do? And then I started researching what it was like to make a booth and looking into how you build a studio and who do I want to coach with? And then my husband and I decided that it did make financial sense that like I was either going to go back to teaching in the city or go into voiceover. So I decided that I was going to go into voiceover and I literally started coaching And when I started studying voiceover, I did it all day, every day. So when I tell you that I started studying, I was doing it like eight hours a day. So I went into it as if the studying of voiceover was my full-time job. And that's how I got into it. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but Grace had a a, uh, a, a follow-up to that. She says, what was your biggest challenge in your first couple of years in your transition from teaching to voice acting? And what was your workaround for that? Um, I think that there were a few challenges. Um, so now my biggest support is that I have my people, that I have my tribe. So I'm in an accountability group with, um, Kim Handyside's Dervla trainer, Michelle Blanker, Diana Birdsall, and Shelly Avellino. Oh, you name dropper. Yeah. And these women are like (laughs) my closest friends and I talk to them every single day. And when you have your people, life is easier because you can you know, if you have a great client, you can fell. And if you have a horrible client, you can fetch and talk to them about how horrible everything is and they get you through it, right? When you need to negotiate rates, they get you through it. Well, when you start, you don't have that support system. Like I had Marie for one day, but I'm not going to call Marie every time I have an issue or she'll like never speak to me again. So until you have your tribe and you don't have a tribe right away, or most of us don't, or I didn't. So the biggest challenge was, you know, trying to figure out how to like, balance everything. And I think for a lot of working moms, not just in voiceover, the home life balance is very hard. So I think until I found my people, and I will tell you that going to conferences is a great way to find your people and being active in the Facebook and Instagram communities, you actually do make connections. And then when you show up at the conferences and you meet the people that you've been on social media with, they're like really there and they're like real humans and it's a very bonding experience. But um, you have to find your people. So until you have your people, it's a little hard. You're working alone in a padded foam booth. So this padded foam booth, um, 
I had a contractor who had been doing work on my house build and he worked with um, with Uncle Roy, who's local to me and with George to like learn the specs and put everything together. And like, so I built the the booth from scratch. And then I was lucky that I had like my own custom booth that's been great. And I've uh, as I've booked more and more work and had more steady clients, I've upgraded my gear over the years. But I didn't start out with such expensive gear that I have now. Um, but it's all about like finding your people and building your network. And that's the hardest part. And And I think the second thing that's hardest is knowing who to take advice from and who to tune out. Because not every, like, I'm blessed to now say that I've surrounded myself with positive people and with good people, but um, it's hard to know who to filter out and who to listen to at the beginning. So you have to be a little bit careful. Have Find people who have your back. Right. Yeah, right. ask for references. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. Uh, yeah. Who, are, who, are your, who are your people? Yeah. I get to ask your question, George. Okay, do it. Okay, yeah, so, please. Yeah, you were talking about auditions and... How often are you asked to send auditions which are raw? And do you process them anyway? Okay. So this is an interesting thing. First of all, I'm on a lot of rosters where I don't have to audition and work just comes to me. So, for example, in the last, like, 12 weeks, I had three national spots running that I didn't audition for. I Just was off your demo. Booked. They're like, we have these. Are you available on this day? And they were, I did a Disney promo this summer, and I didn't audition for it. So um, wow. now in terms of raw audio, I'm on Pandora's roster and that's all raw. But I will tell you something, and George can explain this more in detail. My preamp is a UAD Apollo Mach 2 Thunderbolt, which means that it's never actually totally raw, right? Because it's always processing it. Like right now, the audio that you're hearing has, and I use the, the Manly Vox box. So that means that like, as I'm speaking, it's being processed somewhat because it has settings that are going through it. So you're not really actually hearing me totally raw. Right, George? Uh, yeah. I mean, it sounds, if there is processing, it sounds very transparent. I mean, I can show yeah. you what it is. Do you want to see what I... Eh, you... Not necessary. Well, we could talk okay. about it on Tech Talk next week. Okay. All righty. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, well it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, if the client doesn't know you're processing, then you're doing it right. Right. Yeah. And so if they, so, and, and I will tell you just as an aside, what I typically do when I submit work is that I send them two folders. I send them a raw folder and I always save my raw wave files always, whether they want it or not in my as Dropbox, should, right? but I send them the raw and I send them and it's marked edited with EQ and compression. And then I also always send them stuff they don't ask for, like wilds of the end tag and I'll send them extra versions. And that's my like little workaround to never having to do pickups. Fabulous. Well, wow. Laura Schreiber, it has been wonderful having you with us tonight. We've been looking forward to this for 11 and a half years. Well, mm. I don't know if I've known you that long, but almost. Not quite, but almost. Okay. All right. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, where do they go? What's your website? So my website is www.lauraschreibervoice.com, and my email is laura at com. All righty. Thanks for being with us. It has been great. Thank you so much for having me. It was so nice to spend time with you guys. I'm Thanks, hugging you Laura. again. Hugs. All right. Yeah, more hugs. hugs. All right. All right. George and I will be right back after these messages, so don't go away. You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. 
Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. And... We have more to do. We've got Tech Talk coming up in a little bit. If you're watching live, hang out. If you're not watching live, then you're not hearing me say this. Uh, anyway, <laughs> at this particular moment. Uh, so we would love your questions for, for Tech Talk. Uh, it'll be Tech Talk number 90, by the way, that we're going to do next week. So uh, it just goes on and on. How we do it, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you, you, have you got any webinars coming up? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep the webinar pipes open. And the next one coming up is Adobe Audition Advanced. And this one is going to be on November 30th. 30th. Yeah. But if you want to double check, just go to George, the dot tech slash webinars. That's where the info is. And that's where you can sign up and you can get a 10% discount. Remember, we have that discount code. I mention it every week and it's VOBS fan 10. And you All can right. use that to get a cheaper webinar. Yeah, and we got a clubhouse coming up again with uh, with Jody Krangle, I think, in oh, yeah. a couple of weeks. You know, they just crawl up on us. Oh, we got to do our thing this morning. Okay, that's cool. It's kind clubhouse of become a oh. monthly tradition, but we always have a great time over there. We do. Um, it's a great platform. I know it's kind of created its own little sub sub, not committee, but community. Community, yeah. But it's a passionate one, and it's kind of neat because it's an audio-only format, right? Zero right. video, just talking. Right. You know, and because we both have a face for radio, it, that's really important. <laughs> anyway, who are our donors of the week? We have Robert Leadham. We have Stephen Chandler. Casey Clack. Jonathan Grant. Tom Pinto. Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions. Martha Kahn. 949 Designs. Jonathan Grant. Christopher again, Epperson. I still, we got him in here again. Christopher <laughs> Epperson. Sarah Borges. You know, the guy's so great he gets to be said twice. twice. <laughs> Philip Sapir. Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Ryder. Shauna Pennington Baird. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Diana Birdsall. And, and Sandra, Sandra Manweiler. Alrighty. We need to thank our amazing sponsors Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials, VoiceOver Extra. Yeah, he's been with us since day one. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And WorldVoices.org, the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Go join. Uh, thanks to I Jeff. I just Holt. renewed. What? Oh, I good just boy. <laughs> we now have our whole tech committee back. Uh, Jeff Holman in the chat room. Thanks for doing a great job on that tonight. Sue Merlino, doing it great from far away. Well, you know, she's just all up the way Burbank. across the valley. Oh, uh, yeah, all the way just up Burbank, and of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, we got uh, tech talk coming up, so don't go away. Uh, if you've got questions for us, throw them in the chat room. We will be very happy to answer it. But we got some great stuff to talk about. Anyway, that's going to do it for us this week. Our thanks again to Laura Schreiber for joining us. And remember, if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard, and I'm George Whittem, and this is Voiceover. Body shop or VO BS. Have a good one. Bye bye.